Okay, the more typical uh, condition within a city is that, like Ottawa, it develops, and now here we are in the year 2010, and we're trying to find a way to make it more sustainable, and in my terms, I would mean more dense, more livable, create amenities that, you know, where people want to be here, not that they have to be here. So what do you do when the city is already built up? New York, you know, gets often maligned, right, as the most kind of, you know, this dense, unlivable city, but in fact, New York is the paradigmatic sustainable city of North America because of its density. It has a, 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 a park system that, in addition to Central Park, has 2,000 other parks. And um, through the initiative right now going on, Michael Bloomberg, right, one of the wealthiest men on the planet, uh, he's obviously, a, he's an extraordinarily successful businessman, and his plan to make New York, uh, or for New York to continue to be this economic engine, is to provide more parks. So Bloomberg has been involved in uh, buying every single scrap of land that he possibly can to, uh, to turn it into green space or park space or you know, amenities. So, um, for example, this is the west side. These are uh, 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 piers, uh, shipping piers, you know, a very, very uh, uh, poor neighborhood, warehouses. Uh, most of these piers, you know, shipping gets replaced by uh, cargo airplanes, et cetera. So a lot of these, or the great majority of these piers, and there was uh, probably easily 50 of them remaining, uh, became completely derelict. And so the proposal came about, and nobody's living here either, right? This is a portion, this is a huge portion of New York. It happens to be called the Meatpacking District, which is um, providing, you know, kind of the lowest uh, amount of tax dollars to the city because people aren't living here. It's really uh, a very undesirable uh, component portion of the city until about 15 years ago. Okay, so what um, uh, what's proposed and what uh, what's already kind of well underway is a system where these piers are rebuilt. So you have these kind of fingers that are approximately a thousand feet long, stretching into the river. They're uh, they're uh, they're cooled by the uh, kind of you know, being out in the water. Uh, each one of these piers is converted to a particular use. So there'll be a pier which might be a tennis court. So there might be a pier which is a driving range. There's a pier which is uh, playgrounds for young kids. There's piers which are strolling places for the elderly. So all, everybody's um, needs are accommodated here. And what happens, of course, is as soon as this is built, developers immediately bought up the uh, uh, land along the edge, which formerly comprised warehouses, and you get these extraordinarily expensive condominiums, which are inhabited by the likes of Nicole Kidman and Calvin Klein. So these are people who could live anywhere. And within a span of a few years, where they want to live is the place where these incredibly imaginative, beautiful parks are located. Now, of course, it's not Nicole Kidman who's out here on a Sunday sunning herself, right? The people who are using this park are the people who live way back in these other neighborhoods. But this amenity, which is paid for to a large degree by these kinds of private developments and the private individuals who live here, are providing spaces which are of value to the entire city. So we need to move away from this idea that, you know, why are we building a park, for example, in a, uh, in a, in a good neighborhood? Well, the fact is that it becomes a, a destination point for everybody. The, um, so these are the, some of the piers that I was talking about, and you can see slowly each one of these is being turned into a, uh, a park. Um, there's another thing which is going on, this kind of fierceness to create by under kind of Bloomberg's helm, and, and, and it was commenced, though, by his predecessors. There's, a, um, there's this kind of m maniacal uh, drive to take discarded parcels of land or discarded parcels of anything and to turn it into a public amenity. So, for example... Um, all of these warehouse areas were being serviced by something called the High Line, which is an elevated rail line, which is um, cutting through this uh, area we call the Meatpacking District. You can see pretty well, you know, it's a series of abandoned, well, parking lots and a kind of some abandoned buildings. And this rail line, which stretched all through southern Manhattan starting about 50 years ago, begins to be dismantled. And basically nobody, so it's discontinuous, but they never wanted to spend the money to take all of it down. So it just kind of sat there. And finally, there was an international competition to say, hey, what are we going to do with this? And what they did with it is they turned it into a linear park. So there is connection points, access points down below. This is a very safe place to walk, right? You could be there with your kids. You're away from traffic. You have these incredible views over the city. There's places, again, for you know, the whole spectrum, you know, from the youngest to the oldest. There's elevators that connect up to here if you're, uh, you know, have you know, mobility issues. Um, uh, sometimes 
in this high line, uh, you get uh, you get kind of amphitheaters where performances happen, uh, places you know to le uh, you know to read, places to stroll. Uh, you get water fountains, you get bathrooms, you have everything you need to spend a whole day out in the park. So now again, 10 years before this is built, this is one of the most squalid and dangerous parts of the city. And with this uh, in kind of fantastical park, immediately, again, this kind of frenzy for real estate speculation, uh, uh, an infusion of, uh, enormous infusion of uh, tax dollars, you know, turning a liability into an asset, to the point where uh, kind of the newest, kind of, you know, snazziest hotel in New York, it's a uh, hotel called The Standard, you know, probably about 800 bucks a night to stay here, bought the rights to straddle the, um, the High Line. So it doesn't connect in any way to the High Line, but it wants to be associated with this revolutionary kind of proposal. So again, you know, think of the tax dollars which are arriving in the city because of, uh, because of this hotel, the clientele who stay here are uh, now frequenting all of the, you know, the boutiques and stores and so on which are here. And yes, this is, um, it does become a place where only the wealthiest can live and be right near it, but that does not in any way preclude everybody else from using it. Everybody strolls here, everybody comes here and enjoys the amenities here. It's perfectly maintained. And, um, you know, and somehow all of these, uh, these coexist, but it's exactly this kind of revolutionary transformation of the infrastructure which creates the magnet for these kinds of uh, speculations. Uh, another example, which is maybe more well known, approximately 10 kilometers of a highway, it's like Boston's 417, uh, was tunnelized. Uh, the commute from one end of the city changed from 20 minutes to three minutes uh, by being underground. And the land that's left above is, um, is turned into park systems. So imagine what would happen if we tunnelized, and I'm not necessarily proposing this, but if we tunnelized the 417, these adjacent streets like Isabella and Catherine, which are these you know, very, very unpleasant streets, would suddenly you know, be the most desirable places to be. Uh, in this case, uh, immediately all of the, um, the land values doubled, and at this point they've probably tripled uh, relative to how land is increasing elsewhere in Boston. Okay, so if we think, wow, that's crazy. And then we look at this and we think, well, this has happened here already. If we think of, you know, we think of Ottawa and you have to name one fantastic amenity, we would say, well, it's the canal. Well, we have to remember that the canal is exactly um, uh, similar to, for example, the Big Dig or the transformation of this High Line in New York where the banks of the, uh, the canal, this was uh, used for barges, you know, shipping barges. Uh -oh. Sorry, guys. Keep clicking. This doesn't count as part of my 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jack. Okay. Um, okay, so just to remind all of us here that this kind of transformation and forward thinking has already happened. Uh, Jacques Ribert, the same one who set aside the green belt, was the one who suggested turning the canal into this amenity instead of being a liability. So again, a fantastically expensive project, but what did we get in return for this? Um, you know, a few other, um, so I've talked about parks and creating green spaces a bit. And uh, the other thing which is critical is we have to create better linkages between neighborhoods. We probably all remember these kind of discussions for the Corktown Bridge linking U of O, the Golden Triangle, people in the Golden Triangle fearing that they were gonna be you know, overrun by all the kind of the student hoodlums from U of O. You know, life went on, everything is fine. Uh, suddenly, instead of having to take a bus or to drive all the w from U of O all the way around here over the Bank Street Bridge, for example, we just walk over here, hugely popular, it's a beautiful amenity. Um, and you know, again, one small linkage like that goes an enormous way to suddenly, you know, allowing somebody to, you know, walk from Ottawa South, let's say, to Elgin Street to go shopping, as opposed to having to get in their car. Um, let's think about this, that we have uh, here, this is a, the um, uh, a suburban development that we call uh, Central Park, which is at the end of the experimental farm, where, uh, so, you know, this completely open area suddenly turned into this kind of, you know, nondescript, 
um, kind of sp my estimation completely kind of low density space wasteful development when instead it could have been an incredible park. And there's, you know, on the subject of greenwashing, if you go to the, um, to the website for, uh, for this uh, community, Central Park, right, which is absolutely uh, the most uh, kind of pedestrian sort of suburban development, but, you know, so once that's in place, suddenly the burden is placed on the people who live here to suddenly become green. So it's as if the developer does whatever he wants with absolutely kind of, you know, no imagination, no consideration for real sustainability.